to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly podcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris, and with me tonight is Jesse. And, of course, Robert's absence continues to be the running joke of the show. <laughs> so, uh, before we get too far into the show tonight, just if you, um, well, those of you on YouTube, if you look at the screen and you see all of our contact information, at SST Show on Twitter, uh, JesterCat.com, our website, you can follow us on iTunes. Please, please subscribe. If you like what you hear, uh, click like on the video or um, subscribe in YouTube as well. Ask uh, questions. Also, do all kinds ask, of Let's yeah, make this I, an interactive show. Exactly. <laughs> talk to us, please. That We're lonely. Sad. It's just yeah. Chris and I talk to ourselves. <laughs> yeah. That's not true. We've got some uh, – we have some avid fans. I think so. And you know what? I'm going to take – too many. I'm going to take the lack of questions as the audience saying, we like what these guys <laughs> 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 I think this is the audience. Like, we don't want to mess the brilliance that is <laughs> perfection. <laughs> right. Oh, right. uh, geez. So, yeah, please, please don't hesitate to contact us for show uh, questions, ideas, whatever you might have. So, uh, Jesse, uh, what have you been doing this week? So, uh, playing with my acoustic guitar a bit, which is good. Oh, nice. Um, Working, I bounce back and forth between like a couple of tunes. Um, working on Eric Johnson's Cliffs of Dover. Did I ever tell you I, I work on that? No, oh, okay. So, I do you know that song? It's awesome. I will listen to it after the show is over. Oh, yes, it's like it's an instrumental guitar song, and it's like the awesomest, happy song. I mean, once the tune gets going, it's, you almost have to dance. I don't care how dorky you are, how shoulder dancey you a person is, you, you almost <laughs> have to dance with this song. And, uh, of course, Eric Johnson is just a freaky good guitar player. So, but, so there we are. Austin's cool. best or one so, of the best. How are you learning this song? Are you doing it by ear or do you have tabs, uh, YouTube video? Uh, there's, there's a couple YouTube videos, there's a couple tabs. Um, although, and I don't know how I got this because now I'm kind of revisiting it. I actually, when I started practicing it a few months ago and then kind of went away from it, uh, I don't do it like anything I can find now. <laughs> like no tab, like the main like chords. Uh, uh-huh. So I must have just picked that part up because um, he does a lot of arpeggiating chords and stuff. Um, and then there's like a melody that keeps coming back around for the, the chorus. Um, and that I do like the couple tabs I've seen. Um, but I, I don't know. So it's, I guess the mishmash of like just figuring it out while I'm playing on my couch with, <laughs> you know, doing it by ear and then, but I think most of it is, is tabs. Yeah. No, that's cool. Cool. Excellent. There's great uh, stuff out there. What have you been doing? Yeah. What have I been doing? Oh, good question. Uh, I think a lot of my guitar time has been encompassed by trying to learn Layla, the acoustic version. Mm-hmm. I pretty much know the, the electric version, the original version of the song, right? The acoustic version. I've got, all of it down except for the solo that's sort of towards the end of the song. Mm-hmm. And I have probably 75% of it down, but there's this one bit, it's like a hump that I just can't get over. <laughs> and I, I think it's largely that I'm not able to give enough attention to it. Ah. So, you know, you work a whole day, you get home and like, your mind is partially fried and so I get so far into the solo and then my mind just sort of craps out. Sure. And, and unfortunately, the first 75 percent hasn't really completely stuck either. So I'm tweaking that stuff, too. And the way I learn these things uh, and this may not be the best way to learn these things. Hopefully it's not the worst, but it does tend to work for me is that I will learn the notes first and then I will worry about the actual rhythm of the solo. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I want to sort of get the notes under my fingers and then worry about, you know, quarter notes or 16th notes or what, on the beat, off the beat, whatever the case might be. Sure. I always find that if I can just have the whole thing memorized, then I can adjust on the fly. I can learn the, I can't, I just can't focus on too many things at one time. Right. And I've tried uh, – when I learned the Iron Man solo, I actually did that little bits at a time with the record so that I could you know, do the rhythm and the bit at the same time. And that worked OK. 
Uh, but for some reason with Layla, it's just not sinking in. Yeah. And it's not particularly hard. It's just that it doesn't seem intuitive to your fingers yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is. It's uh, D minor pentatonic, it, It's which is fine. I, it, you know, I play that kind of stuff all the time. It's just, I don't know what it is. I, I think it might just be sort of a, a symptom of being sort of like fried mentally yeah. before I even pick up the guitar. So, uh, yeah, hacking away at that. I think I'm going to work on next uh, Cold Shot. So oh, cool. on. Excellent. Uh, yeah, my instructor recommended that song uh, as a sort of like the next place to go rhythmically. Right, after Pride Warren. and Joy. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I don't want to use the words after Pride and Joy because <laughs> that is going to be a lifelong battle, I think. Um, it's true. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe I should say uh, while continuing to work on Pride and Joy, mm-hmm. uh, Cold Shot. And I mean, and I'm talking about working on Pride and Joy. So the audience is probably thinking, oh, wow, you know, Chris must be like, you know, 90 percent of the way to the song. No, I'm probably 2 percent of the way to the song. <laughs> it's the intro. When I say working on Pride and Joy, I'm talking about working on the intro to Pride and Joy. And in the intro, it's probably the first third that I'm still working on. So uh, it's, so it's here's the thing about Pride and Joy. You know, it's kind of a uh, well, actually, Steve Ray is, is pretty wide ranging anyway, but um it's pretty indicative of his style. So, you know, once you, like, nail Pride and Joy, you're going to have a lot of the uh, sort of calling cards of his sort of rhythm style. Yeah. So, yeah, and I'm hoping some of the other stuff that I focus on, like maybe Cold Shot, will help me sort of work my way into Pride and Joy, too. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, stay positive. You know, Fall Break is coming up, and I think that is the, the kind of time of intensive guitar that you need. I think so. Yeah. I think so. It yeah, it wouldn't be this weekend, but we're going away this weekend, so uh not not any intensive time, but I definitely need to get over this hump. And I, I don't know what it is, but I gotta get over it. So um yeah, I wish I had more to report, but it's been Layla and oh, actually I should say, um exploring the major pentatonic scale. Mm. I've always known it, never really played in it. Yeah. And so my instructor has uh, directed me towards uh, soloing in the major pentatonic. And what interests me is getting into the mixture of the two. Yeah. And so I was watching a video earlier today talking about uh, one of the uh, Marty Schwartz videos mm-hmm. uh, talking about playing major and minor pentatonic over a blues progression. And in this particular video, he was playing an A and he played the major pentatonic on the one and the five chord. Mm-hmm. And on the four chord, the D, he would play the minor pentatonic scale. Right. My, my A minor pentatonic scale. And so uh, I thought, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. And listen to that a little bit and just trying to get a sense of that. But right now what I want to do is, is get the major pentatonic scale sort of some licks down. Just feel comfortable, you know. The tricky thing is for our listeners who maybe not are aware of this, the fingering is the same. The roots are in different places. Right. And so, you know, you want to make sure you end or work around that root properly. Right. And so sort of the things that you do in the minor pentatonic scale aren't going to quite work as well as what you would do in the major pentatonic scale mm-hmm. um, because the roots is, is in a different place. So yeah. so working on that a little bit, um, mostly with YouTube backing tracks. Uh, the Layla I've been learning with YouTube videos. And I think I've mentioned it on the show before, but I have an app for my iPad called Riffer. I think it's R-I-F-F-R. And uh, that's a nice little app. It has lots of tabs. And it's it's like, well, it used to be when you go to Ultimate Guitar or whatever, you, you would uh, get to their website via your mobile browser and you could go right to the tab. Now they have this really large intrusive advertisement which sends you to the app store and it's just kind of a hassle to use that on a mobile platform. Riffer, the app itself... Just gets right to the tabs. There's That's ads sweet. on the bottom, which is fine. I should probably pay for this actually, because I use it enough to actually warrant paying for it and getting rid of the ads. Yeah. Uh, and you get a variety of tabs for each song, and they have star ratings. I don't know about the ratings so much, um, but I've been sort of using the Riffer tabs and uh, Marty Schwartz's video. Uh, the Riffer tabs are slightly different in some spots. The same notes was played in different places. Yeah. Let's take your pick. Yeah, whatever falls on your fingers the best, you know. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so that's a long and winded um, description of what I've been doing. 
That's good. That's good. Want some birthdays? Yeah, let's do some birthdays. I, I have birthdays. Well, I have one death day too. This is terrible. Oh. Uh, Jaco, okay. Jaco Pastorius left us uh, September 21th, 1987. So I know Jaco is not like a guitar player. He's a bass player, but – Jocko. <laughs> so hey. this was, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, he was a bass player primarily from Weather Report, um, a jazz rock fusion kind of band from the late 70s, early 80s. And many kind of hail him, at least at the time, as like the best bass player out there. Um, fell on hard times, died in a bad situation, which that's a bummer. But uh, what a legacy. Um, so birthdays, Lindsey Buckingham, uh, October 3rd. 1949, guitar player for uh, uh, Fleetwood Mac. Sorry about that little brain fade. <laughs> and so he has a really good rhythm style. I mean, it, it's – they're a very highly produced band, at least of the time of the late 70s, you know, Fleetwood Mac. But um, a lot of cool layered guitar parts. He was very creative, you know, and a good soloist too. I mean, not any you know, kind of fire burner, you know, but um, – but a really interesting guitar. So uh, it's one of those things where like almost every time you listen to um, the big stuff, like particularly Rumors album, you just hear a lot of stuff. Of course, they spent like months in the studio <laughs> you know, between the actual recording and creating and doing drugs. I mean, they were there forever. Um, so they had a lot of time to layer stuff on. OK, enough about him. Uh, Steve Ray Vaughan. Um, oh, right. Yeah. So 1954, also October 3rd. Uh, we talk a lot about Steve Ray here, but. Steve Ray, so there you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's a guitar podcast after all. <laughs> Sorry, peeps. Anybody who's not into Steve Ray, that's cool. Yeah, I'm gonna say that's cool. Okay, no more. <laughs> and John Lennon, so uh, October 9th, 1940. Oh. So not the hottest guitar player, but what a creative mind. I mean, he had great guitar parts, and of course, as a songwriter and lyricist, just there you go. Beatles, right? Major oh, Beatles absolutely. fan as a kid, so there you go. That's all I got. <laughs> and we love them all. Bass players, guitar players. I mean, you know, the show is called Six Strings and Things, but they do make six string basses. So that's true. You know, and the things could be a few extra strings, too. So, you know, if you play sure. a eight string bass or. a Yeah. Or one of those like harp guitars. Yes. Yeah. Or a Chapman Shh. stick. Hey, it's all yeah. good. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> we're, we're all good with it. So, yeah. Excellent. So, um. I've been uh, playing around a lot with my Fender Mustang uh, as I've been playing Layla and uh, trying various models. And I have to say, I really like the basic models. And they're the last, say, 10, 15 models or so. Mm -hmm. And it's where they do a specific amp like a 57 Twin. Yeah. And they don't do all the extra pedals and stuff on it. Right. They just do, this is the basic amp we like. The you know the bass knob turned this way, with like a treble knob turned that way, and like this reverb knob turned that way, and this is what it is. Okay, and of course you can tweak those all you like. I like those a lot. But as of late, one of my favorite amps has been what they call um, British eighties, which is essentially a Marshall from right. the eighties, mm -hmm. and I have really liked playing through that model. Mm -hmm. I like the sound, not so much for Layla. But, you know, when I'm soloing over top of backing tracks on YouTube, I've been really digging that sound. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's got a mid-range-ness to it that is just really thick. And actually, if you're – I mean, I know you're just you know playing there. But, I mean, in a band situation, it really is a nice thick sound that kind of fits real nice between bass and vocals. And, and that's why it's a popular thing. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure which specific amp. I, I remember seeing online and somebody said something like a JCM. 800, yeah. 800, yeah, that was it. Yeah, then uh, like I guess late 80s, early 90s, there was a JCM 900 and then a JCM, I think 2000 was the next one. And it just kind of got more gain and more scooped. You know that smile curve, with bass and treble. So it goes from like the mid-range of the 80s metal bands, Priest, Maiden, whatever, the whole British thing, to like Metallica. We got a little more lower bass and more treble and then the thrashy kind of thing and to what we have now, <laughs> you know, it's really heavy. Okay, and yeah. um, and it's, you know, it's a sound of it of its own. It's probably one of my favorites, too. I think the uh, I have one called like hair hair stack or something like that. <laughs> and that's pretty much what it is. It's some modified 800. Yeah. So I hopped online and checked out. Um, Marshall's site and they have a nice little thing. If you go to their site, it'll help you pick an amp. 
Mm-hmm. And so basically you can choose, you know, I am a, so I am a, and it's either a skilled or beginner guitarist. <laughs> so I went ahead and just said, okay, let's just put skilled and boost my own ego here for a moment. So a skilled guitarist looking for a, um, uh, let's see, I think it's valve or tube amp, I think is valve or excuse me, solid state amp. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then with a certain wattage. So I put it in my preferences, I have one to five watts and I came up with a DSL five model. Okay. There's another one that he came up with it. I think it was an SL5 model, which was like the Slash model. Okay. Which seemed pretty pricey. I think it was around eleven, twelve hundred dollars. But wow. the DSL5 was closer to the four to five hundred dollar uh, uh, mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was just kind of curious as to you know uh, what was out there in the small wattage range by Marshall because when I think Marshall, I think stack. Yeah. Right, and that's not going to happen in my house. Right. Right. It's just too small and I'd blow the windows out or something. We don't want to do that. So, so yeah, I've been just working on, um, tone and, uh, playing with tone knobs, trying bridge pickups versus neck pickups. Cause for most of the time I've played guitar, I just left on the neck and not worried about it. Mm-hmm. But my instructor has been very much like, oh, well, you know, you're at the point now where you should be listening to, you know, bridge pickup and turning the tone knob when you're strat and get these different sort of sounds. Mm-hmm. And so I've just been messing around, probably should be messing around with my amp settings more. But for now, I've just been messing around with um, my uh, tone knobs. And one of the things that I've noticed, and I could be totally off base and just totally inexperienced, but I've noticed that there's greater range of sound from my Strat than from my Les Paul. Okay, yeah. When messing with the tones, the tone knobs. Even if I go straight to like bridge or whatever and just start t- turning around with it, I notice more of a difference when I start playing with the tone knob on the Strat. Right. Well, and, the Strat has more sort of treble naturally because of the single coils mm-hmm. for the most part. So, And all a tone knob really does is roll off treble at a certain rate. So if you start with more treble... I, I guess that makes some sense. Um, it could also be my bad ears. It could be my inexperience. Um, but well, I, I've just noticed that. The other thing is the Gibson has uh, two tones and two volumes. Mm-hmm. So if you have both pickups on, everything is sort of interactive. you know, And it's not totally linear. Like It's not like you can turn the volume on one pickup down halfway and it's like, okay, now it's – you know, two thirds the other pickup and one third. It, it really doesn't work that way because as you change the volume, it, it that really kind of is only a straight volume control if there's one pickup volume control to the amp. Now, if you've got two things interacting, um, it, it sort of changes the impedance of that pickup, and that changes how much of it is mixed with the other pickup. And I mean, it gets pretty complicated that I'm not really. I mean, I'm terrible at this stuff. We should have somebody else who's more well-versed in guitar electronics to tell us exactly how this works. Um, But it gets pretty complicated, and so it's kind of a trial and error thing for me. And it's – I don't have many guitars that have like that sort of layout. Um, My 335 copy sort of does. But – and actually, it just depends on the player. I mean, a lot of people really like to just control it all from the guitar. So they'll turn the volume down a little bit, which actually changes the tone in and of itself. Um, slightly, and then of course the tone control. I was always just like, well, I like modelers anyway. <laughs> so I mean, if I can't get it with pickup selection and then amp selection, or change the you know the controls on the amp, you know, I just never had much of an interest in the tone control itself. Okay. With the exception of I had this thing called a tone cube, which actually has some sort of um, little passive array in there that actually changes the resonance of the whole thing it, in a different way than just like treble roll off. And I have no idea how it worked. I mean, it was a little epoxy black cube, <laughs> but it had a different effect than a regular tone control. And I thought it was kind of weird. It was like a passive sort of wah sort of thing. And I found that sort of interesting. interesting. One day I'm going to stick that in one of my guitars <laughs> just because I still have that old thing. Yeah. Um, but I haven't gotten around to it like all the other stuff <laughs> I, don't, I haven't done. <laughs> so, I'm reading online, so I've been, like I said, I've been reading uh, about uh, tone while I've been messing around with my guitars a little bit. And, you know, people talk about changing the pots. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, how much of an effect can that really have? Kind of depends on the pickup. So if you have, like, the traditional thing is a 250K tone pot is what you use for single coils. 
and then a 500K for uh, humbuckers. And the reason is that if you have it cranked up all the way, there's still um, some cut going on. And some, in fact, some people who just want like the loudest, you know, brightest sound like, uh, like Van Halen, it was pick up volume control right out to the amp. No tone control, no anything. Um, and so that's kind of the traditional thing, but really you can mix and match, um, you know, whatever you like. You can try, uh, um, even greater than a 500k pot, like a one mega ohm. You can buy them for a little bit more. Of course, they say better tone, doesn't cut your treble as much, etc. And then if you notice, there's a, a capacitor that's kind of soldered to the tone control. So in addition to the pot, you have this capacitor that, um, Actually, it's soldered to the volume control. I'm sorry. So as you roll down your volume, and this is why it changes your tone a little bit, um, it doesn't roll off the volume on all frequencies equally. You lose treble faster. And so what happens is with this thing, it kind of bleeds some treble directly to the output. So as you roll off the volume, it sort of keeps the treble at a higher level. It's it's pretty... I don't know. It's convoluted. I, I, don't, I don't think to... I don't pretend to understand... You know all the ins and outs of it, but that's yeah. the basics. Yeah, I mean, I, I am a physicist, but I teach only electronics, <laughs> or introductory, introductory physics, which is very minimal. I'm definitely not into electronics, but it seems like that's something I should probably learn more about since I have a physics background. I should probably crack open some of these things and uh, sure. understand I mean, it better. And of course, this is all just a classic, you know, passive guitar electronics. I mean, once you get into like active pickups or emgs or have a preamp or something like that all that sort of gets out the window and now it can be whatever you want as a tone control you could have parametric eqs and you know all sorts of stuff which basses actually typically do they have more advanced sort of electronics than guitars usually do really oh yeah like even inexpensive couple hundred dollar like ibanez basses will have like active preamps in them with um and what's nice about that is you can have um bass and treble I mean, for one thing, you have both of those controls and maybe even a mid-range control and they can boost and they can cut. It's a full preamp. So it um, gives you a lot of flexibility. So what kind of pickups are usually on a bass? Are they single coil, double coil? Do they tend to be active? Um, not well. Okay. So the, the most popular bass, I think, is still the Fender Precision and the copies of it. And that's mm-hmm. all passive still. And I think they're just single coil. Well, so the, I think you just have, if you notice, it's sort of a split pickup. Yeah. So essentially one half of it is sensing two strings, the other half is sensing the other two strings, and it's wired so that that is a humbucking circuit you know, by itself. And okay. then the other version was the jazz bass, which had sort of two single coil pickups more akin to like a strat pickup, but just for four strings. Those then you could switch and put you know, in a humbucking mode or there'd be single coil. Then – after that, and I don't know when this started, 70s probably, you started getting a mix. So like the one that's – the pickup that's closer to the neck is that P bass split thing. And then the one by the bridge is like a jazz bass sound. So you can sort of get both sounds or mix and match and do everything. you know. And of course, after that, now everything is – the sky's the limit. You see Bartolini's or whatever that are um, – I think typically some sort of humbucking circuit because they're not very – you know, they're pretty quiet. So if we go back to like the jazz versus precision bass, uh, what are the sounds that you get out of the two? I mean, is there one that's more of a rock sound? Is one more of a classical sound? I mean, what's right? What's so the, the the P bass is the precision is kind of the standard bass, <laughs> I guess you could say, and it's like uh, it has a decent amount of you know treble to it. I mean, it is a bass instrument, so it's right. not going to have the treble that a say, guitar is, but. Um, and so I guess if you think of that as like the standard bass, there's not typically much, as much treble to it. Although, of course, it depends on how you set your amp. You can have as much, you know, click to it if you want or, you know, slap or whatever you do. The jazz bass, one of the things that's cool about that is because it had a pickup that's really close to the bridge, you could get that really trebly lead sound. So if you think about something like a, a Jocko or, you know, somebody who's using a jazz bass, um, they could do bass solos and, and everything was very clear. You know, you can really hear the notes, especially if, like Jocko, you had like a fretless bass. Um, and then, of course, once they started mixing those types of pickups and switching between them, you had anything you wanted pretty much. Cool. So, I mean, those are just kind of a couple examples. Of course, there's all kinds of stuff out there like, you know, Geddy Lee, the Rickenbacker bass, which was like, at least in his band, really trebly, you know, so you could hear, you know, the higher notes and... 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm very ignorant when it comes to bass. I'm interested, though. And so uh, I think that's definitely a direction I'd like to get to at some point. Uh, just experimenting with bass a little bit um, just just for fun. Yeah. You know, uh, I doubt I would convert to be a bass player. I think what I would do is like this would be something that would just be to complement what sure. I'm already doing. Well, one of the things that's nice is, I mean, your scales and everything co- uh, transfer to the right. bass. It's tuned the same way as the bottom four strings. Um, right. So um, you don't really have to learn. I mean, you have to learn different placement and everything because the scales are different and whatnot. But um, so what a lot of guitar players do once they start getting into recording, and this is why I got into bass at all. Not that I'm like into bass or do anything other than totally suck at it. But <laughs> but um, so you get into, it's like, hey, I'm going to write a song or whatever. It's like, so you have the guitar part. And of course, I can't play drums. I don't have a drum, but you have a drum machine or a drum software or something like that um, or loops. And then it's like, well, bass. Well, if I was a keyboard player, I'd use bass patches or, you know, something like that. But as a guitar player, well, I could just get a bass for a couple hundred bucks and right. either use my same modeler or get a little bass amp or whatever you're going to do. And so that's how a lot of guitar players get into it. And um, and if they're in a band and they are not as good a guitar player as the other guy, they end up playing bass. <laughs> <laughs> that is not uh, OK. Mostly, I'm not serious. <laughs> Sorry, bass players. That's terrible. That's funny. That's funny. Get a, <laughs> Mostly, I'm not serious. I'm going to get a nasty uh, note from like Victor Wooten or some great bass well, player. That, that would be awesome because then we would actually have listener feedback. Oh, that's true. Victor Wooten, if you are listening to our podcast, please let me. <laughs> <laughs> guy is awesome. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I, I think I, I guess what all this conversation for me is is about sort of getting – starting to focus on tone Mm -hmm. Uh, as, as much as, you know, learning new songs, playing scales, playing Lee, whatever, but really focusing on the different sounds that the guitar can make. Oh yeah. You know, without fiddling with the amp, just understanding the basics of the instrument now. Right. Uh, And I think one of the things that I would like to do in the uh, not too distant future would be either get a um, sort of like a Squire uh, strap, or one of those kits and have it something that I would be very comfortable with taking apart and swapping parts in and out. Yeah. Say, oh, you know what? This, you know, these uh, pickups are on sale of guitar fetish. Why not buy them? That'd be something that I don't care about throwing them in. It plays well. Listen to the sound, see if I like it, you know. And then if I like it, say, you know what? It might go into my actual, you know, American strat. Yeah. Or, you know, but just some kind of like uh, something to just tinker with yeah so actually if that's the case you need to have an eye toward a guitar that's easy to um pop pickups and whatnot out of because actually a strat is not that easy to modify comparatively because uh like especially if you have like a string through or whatever i mean i don't think you just pop the bridge off with the string still on it yeah no you can't you know i mean like i've had and as much of a pain as floyd rose um you know, vibratos can be um, like my Ibanez with a Floyd on it. It's like I can just pop the springs out the back of the guitar, pull the bridge off with all the strings still connected. And now I have access to electronics, pickups, the whole thing. Interesting. And um, and of course, without a pick guard, I can, you know, if I if I already have pickups mounted in rings, I can just pop those pickups out. If I'm clipped, I can just unclip them instead of unsoldering if it's like a trial guitar, as you're saying. And that whole thing could take, I don't know, five minutes maybe. Right. Pop the new pickups in there, screw them down, and then put the bridge back on. And not only is it easy, it's in tune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't I didn't know that there were guitars out there that you could take the pickups out without taking the strings off. Yeah. It's all about the bridge. And the thing about the Floyd is it has two points, you know, two pivot points. Um, and I know there's a lot of like non-double locking um bridges that are like that instead of having like the six screws like the traditional strap bridge even fender has some of these that have the two pivots yeah um now whether with that sort of guitar you have enough leeway on the strings because the thing about a floyd is um you can uh once you take the springs off there's just enough kind of fudge factor there that you can get it off the pivot points Mm -hmm. so it's really specific to the bridge and i'm not familiar enough with anything other than a floyd because i've had tons of those um to, to tell you but I would think oh, I know, that. Go ahead. 
Uh, so I know the, Amer- the American standards are all, I think, two point now. Right. Uh, I think they've been that way since for a while. I don't know how long, but they've been that way for a while. Yeah. Now, since they're not locked down, you probably have to put like a capo up at the first fret to make sure your strings just don't all go doing all over the place. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah. Or I just, you know, use cheaper strings. <laughs> just keep changing and, the strings. And, and just, you know, instead of. You know, there's, I'm not going to – I wouldn't do like new pickups every week. Right. You know, so when a new pickups come in, just pull the strings off, put new strings on. Don't worry That's about true. it. You know, I because I'm looking at – you know, if I were to do that, it would probably be once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. You know, because otherwise I'd have a pile of pickups being collected. I have no place <laughs> for them. That's what we need. Just, we need a pickup swap shop. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> it's like – just trade pickups. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, uh, that's about, I think, our half hour or so, give or take. Uh, so, folks, if uh, you enjoyed what you're here tonight, please, please click like, subscribe, all those things. Interact with us at SST Show on Twitter, or you can email me, at Chris, at JesterCat.com, and I'll get back to you. Uh, we'd love to hear your suggestions. Uh, until then, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Cult. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 